there is an obligation on ministers to tell the truth. And saying that your taxes are in order when you know they're not is not telling the truth. There we have Dan Needle, who is the founder of Tax Policy Associates. And he is the tax expert who made the former Chancellor Nadeem Zahawi's tax issue public. Um, he joined Bloomberg earlier this week to uh, wade in on the ongoing drama that's become something of a scandal, in fact, surrounding the Conservative Party chairman and whether he has been truthful about his tax affairs. And listening to Dan talking, you could draw the conclusion that he doesn't think Zahawi is being entirely truthful. And of course, Rishi Sunak's spokesman this week has declined to vouch for the former Chancellor's honesty. But it's shone yet another light, hasn't it, on the deep connections between the Tory party and the city of London, but also the enormous wealth of many of the people right at the top of the Conservatives. And um, this big problem right in the middle of the economic troubles that the country finds itself in is causing a great big political headache for the Prime Minister. I'm David Merritt, and this is In the City, Bloomberg's podcast connecting you to the stories and the voices at the heart of the city of London. So this week, the Tory party is in turmoil again, this time about the tax affairs of former Chancellor Nadeem Zahawi. And we've learned a lot about Mr. Zahawi's enormous wealth and the relatively small amount of tax he's paid on that. And perhaps he's, quotes carelessness with filling out his tax return, something that I know is on everyone's mind as the deadline looms. So we spoke with Professor Arun Advani, who studies tax systems around the world, how governments deal with wealth. And he's got some suggestions for how the government could better handle this very highly politically charged question. But first, we spoke with our man in Westminster and the lord of all the WhatsApp chats groups amongst Tory MPs, our very own Alex Wickham. Alex, thank you for coming back to In The City. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. Um, have you done your tax return yet? <laughs> I actually have. Um, all the all the sort of uh, little journalistic add-ons, all good fun. Yeah, I, um, I I actually came into the office last weekend to do it. Obviously, the deadline's looming. I thought I need it. I need to be you know undistracted, and it was get added. You know, it was given an added piquancy. I think this year it's never a fun job, but the kind of the contrast between you know all those boxes that say things like you know, foreign investments, um, income from other sources all around the world, you know, no, no, yeah. no, no, <laughs> no. And, you know, paltry amount of kind of interest given to me by my bank. And I, I just sort of sat there comparing this with the eye-popping numbers of our former chancellor and thinking, well, I feel a little bit insignificant. Now. Do, you, do you think people around the country are feeling that as well? I think that is exactly, exactly it, you know, Regardless of the ins and outs of whether he's paid his taxes, whether he's in whether he's in trouble with the tax ban, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the sheer scale of this is just something that sums up one of the problems that the government has, which is if you if you're a normal person, you look at the deans of Harway and you sort of go, well, I mean, how can you have forgotten to pay three three billion pounds in taxes? How can you have been careless about that? As his statement, his own statement says, I mean, careless is oh yeah, you know, I, I missed, like you say. Ten pounds of interest off my off my tax bill or something. We've obviously we've had the non-dom row over the prime minister's wife. We all know about his extensive wealth. Is the wealthiest prime minister we've had. And then of course we just had this issue about the former prime minister Boris Johnson and the BBC chairman Richard Sharp alone for you know eight hundred thousand pounds to cover his. Like, I mean you know that's again a number that people won't be able to identify with. And so in terms of kind of how much you would need to live your life or it's more than a lot of people earn in their careers. So how much damage is all of this doing um, out there in the country, do you think, in terms of the political fortunes of this government? I think quite a lot. I mean, on the one hand, you know, the tax, the private tax affairs of, of cabinet ministers are quite technical, very technical. And certainly even we as journalists don't understand the ins and outs of them. We don't know the full details yet. The Prime Minister doesn't. That's why he's you know called this inquiry into, into Nadim Zahawi. But it's the principle that everybody can get. Everybody understands it. Like you say, if a normal person goes to the bank for a, a £10,000 loan to do some home renovations or something, you, you know, compared to 
the money that Boris Johnson is talking, you know, is talking about, and then and then certainly on a, on an even different level to that than the Nadim Zahawi money. And there's nothing intrinsically wrong with being a rich person, a person who's been successful in business. It's great that we politics can attract successful business people into it to to you know get the the, the finest minds and all of that sort of thing. But the problem is when you've got Nadim Zahawi worth. You know, tens of millions of pounds, having to explain to Rishi Sunak with his family worth hundreds of millions of pounds about, you know, where this five million pounds worth of tax has gone missing. It is just, you know, it just feeds into the narrative that the Tories just don't get it during a cost of living crisis, inflation, prices rising, all of this sort of thing. It just feeds into it. And everybody can understand that. And everybody can see, you know, ultimately, they're not quite like us. But, you know, to be fair, as you said, we want to attract business people into politics. And let's just remind everyone that Nadim Zahari founded the polling company YouGov. It went on to be enormously successful and influential, still is. And in fact, you know, ironically, of course, I'm looking at a YouGov poll in your story, Alex, you wrote, going, the Tories are lagging Labour by more than 20 points. But, you know, it's YouGov who are giving that information. But I think, you know, the, 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 the broader point here is that we do want successful people or people who know how to run businesses and know how to create wealth and boost the economy uh, running the government. So shouldn't we be a little bit more relaxed about some of this stuff? I mean, I think British voters historically, they don't really go for the politics of envy. You know, it's, no. if you look at the last hundred years of British his political history, they haven't really elected many hardcore socialists. They haven't really, you know, tried to soak the rich too much you know, generally, certainly compared to perhaps some, some other countries. But, you know, I, I, you just feel that this is on a different scale, you know, and where it's landed in the political cycle. It's of, the timing, right? It's, it's the, the timing. timing. Last time we chatted, I think, on In the City, we it was in the, the absolute height of the trust drama and we were taking bets about how long she was going to last. And, was, and we all know about the lettuce, obviously. And I, I think she didn't even last out that day. But, <laughs> and you talk memorably about the, um, I think, the exploding head and vomit emojis on the, <laughs> on the chat groups on WhatsApp. What, what sort of emojis are we seeing at the moment? Are people, um, how are people um, really uh, chronicling this on those all important WhatsApp groups? Yeah, the, I mean, the, the mood in the Tory party, let's be honest, is never good. And it hasn't been for, for years. Um, but, and uh, I mean, it is true, though, that we're only a few months into Rishi Sunak's premiership. He would absolutely have hoped for a honeymoon period. He would have hoped for people to be saying, oh, come on, give him a chance. He's only been in for five minutes. You know, he needs to he needs to work out how it all, all works and, you know, have a, at least a couple of years before, you know, before we make a make a judgment on, on whether he's a good prime minister or not. But already Tory MPs are grumbling. And the main issue, to be honest, is growth and tax and you know the treasury briefing out very clearly no, no tax cuts coming in the in the march budget you know you're going to have to wait the public finances that we had out this week worse than bad, right? worse yeah. than expected uh, in terms of uh, you know government debt and borrowing and you know there is just no good news from the government i mean there is a way to raise more money that is perhaps politically palatable and you can imagine if there was a labor government in power at the moment that they would be looking at things like capital gains which was the uh, the structure that mr zahari is is using to tax his, his wealth and you know people who work in the city of london the people who are the highest earners in the country there's a relatively small constituency of people who you could potentially tap for more tax but uh, politically, broadly, that could find support in the country. But the the connections to the city are just a little bit too deep, aren't they, for them to consider sort of rinsing uh, their backers in that way. And a good example of that is is non-dom status, where Labour have said, you know, we, we, we would scrap non-dom non -dom status and spend the money on, on a pay rise. Pro probably quite popular in the public. Right. As, as large, right? And it's, it's a populist policy, let's be honest. You know, scrapping non-dom status... Oh, it'll raise a bit of money, but it's not, you know, it's not a, a, a silver bullet that, that fixes the economy. I mean, Mrs. Sunak gave hers up, right? She did. Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, I wonder if that's where the story might turn next, because talking of HMRC settlements. But I mean, Labour can, it is easy for Labour to say, look, l identify and take advantage of the, of the Tories' weakness as being seen as out of touch and being seen as on the side of, of the super rich. They can pick something like non-dom status, say we'd get rid of it. It's not going to probably do that much in damage to the economy in terms of uh, 
attracting investment and talent into Britain. But it's certainly something that will resonate with people. And, uh, you know, speaking to Tory MPs, it is something that you know, increasing numbers of Tory MPs are saying, for goodness sake, why don't we just scrap non-dom status? You know, why, why, why don't we just try and get ahead of Labour on some of this stuff? Because otherwise going into an election campaign, they're just going to paint us as, you know, helping out the, helping out the super rich. And, and ultimately, whether it's the Boris Johnson BBC story, whether it's Nadim Zahavi and his taxes, this idea that a sort of elite, you know, behind closed doors sorts it all out with HMRC or sorts it all out with you know the BBC it can sound a bit conspiratorial but also there's an element of truth to it and that is the sort of thing that really does wind people up because it makes it just makes people a bit a bit sick and and you know ultimately if if when we're doing our tax returns we're we're careless then we are unlikely to be able to negotiate a, a settlement with HMRC that uh, makes everyone happy and we don't have to worry about it. It's going to be much more serious. Well, I, I was actually very... When I'd finished, when I'd finally filed my one last weekend, Alex, it, it, you know, the, the thing pinged back that I'd actually overpaid tax and I was due a rebate, you know, £94. So <laughs> there, there, won't, there won't be I, a career in politics for you then. No, I went out and celebrated straight away. Excellent. Uh, Alex Wickham, thank you so much for joining us. Okay, so this whole conversation about Zahawi's uh, tax problems got us thinking a little bit more about how the entire tax system works, or, or rather doesn't when it comes to how much the wealthy are paying. And we came across a paper from the LSC that asked this question, how much tax do the rich really pay? And uh, I'm very pleased to say one of its co-authors, Professor Arun Advani, has joined us in the London studio. He's an associate professor in the economics department at the University of Warwick, and he's also a research fellow at the Institute of for fiscal studies. Everyone, welcome to In the City. Morning. I guess my first question is, I mean, did this this big story about Sahari, it's been dominating the news all week. Uh, this is what you study for your work. Do you, were you surprised by by what the world is now discovering about his tax affairs? It's worth saying, you know, we, we have access to data from HMRC for all of the work that we do, and it's all anonymous, so we don't know anything about kind of particular individuals. But I think one of the you know striking things for me was less about the specifics of his apparent non-compliance, his, his not paying what he was supposed to have paid, but actually the fact that when you sort of step back, you see that the, the story is that he got £27 million in capital gains, it's, it's been reported, and he was supposed to pay about £3.7 million in tax. So when you think of what that is as a tax rate, that's like strikingly low. The thing about that, which might surprise other people if they've sort of sat and done the numbers, is that it's very low compared to what you'd expect for someone with millions of pounds. You know, normally we'd think of the headline tax rate for people who are high income as being 45, 47%, so 45% as the top rate. And then there's a couple of pence also of national insurance that they're paying. So you'd think, you know, you'd be paying, like getting on for half of that money away. But actually it's much, much lower. And that's, that's because capital gains have uh, a number of features. One is that they just have a lower tax rate in general, but then on top of having the lower tax rate of 20% rather than that top 45%, you could at the time get up to £10 million pounds at only 10%. That's now gone down to £1 million, pounds, but at 10%. And so that's, you know, 10% is the sort of rate you'd expect someone on £15,000 a year to be paying, so below a full-time minimum wage sal- uh, salary. And that's the kind of rate you could, you could get before up to £10 million. Pounds. You can now get that on the first million pounds of capital gains. You know, these are numbers which are astonishing for most members of the public. Could you explain a little bit more about this difference then, this capital gains, the different rate of tax you can pay on capital gains versus normal income, and why that structural uh, difference favours the wealthy? Capital gains are the sort of thing that most people will never experience in their life in the way they'll have to report tax on it. If you think of anything in capital gains, most people think of having a second home. So somebody who owns a second home and sells it, if the the value of that home increased between the time they bought it and the time they sold it, they have to pay tax on them. That's capital gains tax. Uh, that's actually a very small share of what most capital gains uh, come from. Most capital gains are actually from the ownership of businesses. So if you own a business, you set up a business and at some point you sell it, which is the example we have here with uh, Nadim Zahawi. Or indeed, if you set up a business and then at some point you just liquidate the business. So you don't sell it, no one wants to buy it from you, but you just say, I'm, I'm sort of shutting down the business and all of the value of the business now comes to me then the change in the value over that time, so the value that you sell the business for, or you, the value of the business when you liquidate it, less the value it was when you set it up, that's what you get in capital gains. And those capital gains are taxed at much, much lower um, tax rates than income tax rates. So as I said, the sort of headline rate uh, is 20%. There's a higher 28% if it's on second and, and additional properties. 
And then there's this, this special low 10% rate for people who have a business that they own and manage. They get a lower rate on the first now million pounds. So Zahawi sold his business and that's where this big lump sum come, came from. So to be to be fair, I guess, this isn't the sort of income that people would expect to generate year on year out. So is that one of the reasons why the tax rate is actually nominally, you know, quite significantly lower for it? It's interesting. The structure of capital gains tax has changed so many times over the last, you know, changed about every 10 years. So there was a big reform by Nigel Lawson in 1988. 1998 was Gordon Brown and then 2008 was uh, Alistair Darling. And the, this, the, the kind of difficulty with capital, like, capital gains is you want to find some way to ensure that you are kind of encouraging entrepreneurship, right? Like one of the things that capital gains are about is if you set up a business and grow it, then that's a capital gain. So you want to encourage that. But what you don't want to encourage is people sort of setting up what is, and which is not the case certainly in, in the Harvey's case where, you know, YouGov is clearly a very large and very successful company. But what you don't want to encourage is along the side of, you know, the small number of cases of someone like Zahawi who sets up a successful business, a lot of people who have, you know, a consultancy business that would be just someone paying them an income to work as a consultant. But instead they take their money through a consultancy business and keep the money in the business and at some point dissolve the company and get the money out that way and get the low rate. So what you don't want to encourage is someone who would otherwise have been paying 45% income tax and 2% national insurance, who instead is now able to pay this sort of 10% and 20% rate by just getting money paid not to them personally, but getting paid to their business, and then at some point them taking the money out of the business. And so that's that's kind of what that trade-off is. And so one, one way to square that circle is to say, well, what you could do is to have a tax rate on capital gains that looks more similar to the income tax rate, but where, because, you know, as you say, capital gains are quite lumpy, they sort of come out at one point in time rather than annually, what you could do is to average out the capital gains and say, okay, you've owned this business for 10 years and you've made, say, £27 million pounds or whatever it is. We'll divide that up and think of that as £2.7 million pounds a year. And that, that's how we'll think about the taxation of it. And then that would be a way in which if you've, I mean, £2.7 million pounds is still going to be in the top rate. But, you know, if what you ended up with was £40,000 a year, then not all of that would be taxed at that top rate because it's you know clearly much lower than what we would charge for the 45% rate. I mean, Britain, of course, has a big problem on tax and that we, we need to somehow raise more. We had a big, uh, a big feature out this week on Bloomberg by Phil Aldrich about the funding problems of the NHS. And there's some pretty alarming charts in that around the need for Britain to raise more in tax. But Britain needs to somehow pull in more money, uh, whether it's from a change of the capital gains system, somehow boosting the coffers of the Treasury. How, in your view, should they do that? Should they be pursuing the wealthy more to pay bigger share of the tax income? So I would think about it less as pursuing the wealthy and more as pursuing wealth. And so the distinction there is, it's not about trying to tax people just because they are rich. It's particularly about trying to tax money that comes from wealth, from owning assets and getting a return on that, relative to taxing labour. At the moment, we tax labour pretty heavily. So if you work, you know, even if you're on a very high income, you know, people who are, you know, a quarter of people who are uh, earning above £100,000 are paying sort of what you'd expect that headline rate to look like, which is, you know, once you get to £2 million, it's about 47%. But even when you get to 150000 and you hit that, 45p rate it's still the case that you've got most of your income taxed at a lower rate than that and so you know the average rate that you're paying is, is below that but there's, there's this chunk of people who are actually paying those rates but there are a lot of people who are on those very high incomes who are paying actually their effective tax rate is much lower and that's because the form in which they take their income so it could be that they get money as dividends and dividends are taxed at lower rates uh, than, than labor income it could be that they own properties and they get money from renting them out, that's taxed at a lower rate. And also it doesn't, isn't covered by national insurance or uh, health and social care levy uh, that, that, as it was. So there are these kinds of other forms you can take in. And then, you know, as we've just been discussing, capital gains is taxed at a much lower rate. And so people who get income or you know, gains, who get returns from capital, from owning assets, are actually taxed at much lower rates than people who are taxed on labour income. And that means that it's not just about the difference between rich and poor, although it is the case that money from capital is... M kind of something that happens more for rich people than for poor people. But it's also the case that even among the rich people, there are some people who are paying really those headline rates. There are people who, who earn millions of pounds and are paying 47%. You know, they might be a banker in the city and the only income they have is their PAYE income. And it's very high, but it is, you know, almost half of it is being taxed away. At the same time, there's somebody else who's a consultant and who instead left, you know, some big consultancy firm uh, and they've gone and set up their own consultancy. They're effectively just doing the same job they were doing before, but they're paying a much lower rate. And actually, that's that's bad for growth as well. It's, sort of, it's bad because they're getting this lower tax rate in a way that's not really because they're doing something kind of different. But if they're not trying to grow this consultancy and make it some big thing, they're actually just, you know, a fantastic consultant. But now they've 
at the same time had to set up their own business, do the paperwork. They're the one who has to now do some of their own HR, deal with an accountant, all of those other bits. Those are all just things that they're not the best person to do. It would be much better for them to go and work for some big consultant so you could do that stuff for them. And so they're being less productive. And it's worth it for them because they get such a lower tax rate that their take home is bigger. But kind of collectively, that's inefficient. It would make much more sense for them just to be inside a big company that could organize all of the other administrative bits for them and they could just get on with the bit they're fantastic at. What's the solution here? Should we have a, a special wealth tax? Lots of countries have a wealth tax, don't they? Um, in Europe and around the world. Should should Britain think about that? It's been mooted a few times, but always dismissed. What, what should we do? Yes, yeah, so there's a few parts to that. So the first thing is, if we're trying to fix bits of the tax system and raise money, the first places I would go is to fix some of the problems of capital gains tax, which would be something like the Nigel Lawson reform. So equalize the rate with income tax, have an allowance for, at least for inflation, certainly like, like Nigel Lawson did, but do that averaging that we talked about so that you're not taxing the lumpiness of that of that gain and you're, you're spreading that out over time and getting rid of the fact that at the moment if you can hold an asset till you die you don't have to pay the tax on it so you, you kind of hand on the asset to your, your kids and the, and the capital gains tax gets wiped out so you'd fix that you'd fix some of the problems with inheritance tax where agricultural and business property don't get taxed uh, and pensions in fact if you can hang on to them don't get taxed um, so if you kind of in the existing tax system there are things you'd fix again uh, actually property at the moment someone who's you know on minimum wage will will like earn their income and pay income tax and national insurance and they'll go home and pay their landlord some rent and that rent will be you know the, the land will be taxed income tax but won't pay national insurance so those kind of things i would fix first um, and they, they would raise substantial amounts of money but then i think if you're going beyond that there is some case for a regular like annual wealth tax it wouldn't be one that would affect a large swathe of the population the, the case that people i think could make for an annual wealth tax is if you need to raise some money, you could raise, for example, a, a, an annual wealth tax of about 1% on only the wealth above, say, 10 million pounds. So if you have 10 million and one pound in wealth, you're going to pay one pence. But you know, it's only once you get substantially above that 10 million pounds that you're starting to pay any of that. And that would affect about 22,000 individuals uh, in the UK. But that would raise quite a lot of money. So a 1% tax above 10 million would raise about uh, 11 billion pounds which is just, just from just from 22,000 people just from 22,000 people which is like the same as about putting one and a half to two p on the basic rate of income tax so it's a, it's a substantial amount of money um that you'd be getting from doing that but the case for doing that is so it's partly a, a revenue case but the other i think kind of practical case is that we know that for that group actually even if you fix those other taxes on wealth um, they're probably not going to be enough to get much revenue from those people. Uh, and there's just, you know, you can see that in the statistics. So there's you know, a famous graph that the Office for Tax Simplification, a government body, uh, put out a couple of years ago where they showed what the uh, effective tax rate on uh, inheritance tax is. And it sort of rises. So the, the headline tax rate on inheritance tax is 40%, but only on the wealth above a, a, a threshold. And so as a, for a couple who own a property, you, you only start paying after about a million pounds. And so that tax rate starts to rise after a million pounds. It rises to a peak at about 20% uh, of 20%, about 2 million pounds. But then it starts to fall off. So that at 10 million pounds, it's down back at about 10%. And that's because once you get to those levels of wealth, you know, clearly there are things you can do to try to plan to try to minimize your uh, tax rate. And so that, that's kind of the case that people, I think, can uh, make for a wealth tax, an annual wealth tax is that at those higher levels of wealth above about 10 million pounds, the administrative costs are pretty low. So you can do, deal with all of the valuation and complications uh, that come around that. You can raise substantial revenue and you're getting tax from a set of people who actually won't be paying as much tax uh, from those other uh, capital taxes, even if you were to fix those taxes. But, but the argument has always been, hasn't it, you, you, you'd frighten people off. People don't care about what's, what's the tax rate. What they care about is like at the end, after you've paid your tax, what, what lifestyle can you afford? And those, that's you know, what people are looking at when they're saying, do I want to be, live here or there or somewhere else? It's like, well, what's my life going to look like there? And so a lot of those other basic services and things in, in the economy won't be changed by that. Actually, you know, sort of conversely, the worry might be for a set of people. Well, as public services in the UK degrade, I mean, it's certainly the case that if you're at a high enough level of wealth, you might, you know, be, you're, you're potentially more likely to be using private healthcare and private schools. You're probably not queuing up at A&E. So you maybe you're, not, you're, you're probably not queuing up at A&E or, you know, waiting, you know, how many hours it was now for an ambulance. But it still is the case that it's not a, you know, it's not a great place to live when that's what the society around you looks like. So there is a case for sort of being involved in that. The other thing actually just quantitatively that I can say is, you know, specifically for a subset of very wealthy people who, you know, who are the non-doms, there were actually some big reforms where, you know, some of them were brought into, uh, you know, the, the, non, the, the non-dom regime is one that let people not pay tax on their foreign uh, investment income and foreign capital gains. Like, like the prime minister's wife. Like the prime minister's wife. And for people who'd been in the UK for more than 15 years, or for people who were 
born in the UK to a UK father who previously were able to claim non-dom status if they went and lived abroad for a little while, but then came back. Um, for those people, the regime was removed. And so that was effectively an increase of about 10% in their tax rate, which was pretty large. We actually expected that we'd see some movement uh, based on that. Um, but we actually found that about 0.2% of people responded to this, which was tiny. Kind of naturally thought, well, let's try and talk to some people and see if we can get a sense for what's going on. And that's where, you know, when I talked, we actually did talk to a few non-doms and they said, look, we, you know, we were affected by, or former non-doms, said we were affected by this reform. But ultimately, you know, I, my kids are in schools here and I like that. And right. I like I'm to go to the theatre and I like the restaurants. Yeah. And I, you know, like, there's all these things in London that, you know, it's, a lot of non-doms, it's, it's worth saying, a lot of non-doms live specifically in London. So this is, this is in the city and, you know, London is where a lot of them want to be. Of course, the deadline's looming for everyone, isn't it? The, 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 mm-hmm. the, uh, January the 31st. Have you, have you done yours yet? Um, I've done mine. I, 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 I always end up doing mine between Christmas and New Year's. That's oh, yeah, that's a very good time, isn't it? When, you know, <laughs> it's to be time. distracted or when you're feeling miserable yeah, anyway, we can all just kind of uh, yeah, plod through it. Sort it out. Professor Arun Advani, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks very much. Thanks for listening to this week's In the City. We'll be back next week. But in the meantime, if you like our show, please head on over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts and rate review and subscribe this episode was hosted by me david merritt it was produced by summer sardi additional editing by blake maples and special thanks to alex wickham and arun advani and remember you've got less than a week to finish your tax return <laughs>